Hello everyone and welcome back to Rebooted MCU. Today we are here with Rebooted MCU Phase 5 Part 5. Now before we get started, I want to actually thank you all because now only about 63% of returning viewers are not subscribed to the channel. That is a major decrease from the past few episodes. So thank you all for subscribing and making sure that your subscription status was checked. But I want to go ahead and remind everybody to just go ahead and double check real quick. It really helps me and the channel grow. If you make sure that you are subscribed, especially if you are a returning and recurring viewer on the channel. So with that being said, we have two projects to get through today. So while yes, this is the fifth part of Rebooted MCU, this will technically cover projects five and project six. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump in to the first project that we'll be covering today. The fifth project of Rebooted MCU Phase 5 is Deadpool. Now most of this movie stays the same, so this is similar to what I used to do in Phases 1 through 3. So I just want to sort of talk about a few of the changes that get made to this project. So of course we still have Wade Wilson, Deadpool, played by Ryan Reynolds. One of the best castings for a superhero of all time in my opinion. And here are some of the differences. So, in between Hercules and Deadpool, Ajax was actually subjected to the Weapon X testing as a result of him allowing Wolverine to escape following his mission to capture the Hulk. This would have been done by Val, because as we've seen in previous projects, Val is very extreme and is not willing to let someone fail on their job and let them get away with it. Now, Wade Wilson is aware that the Golden Awakening gave him abilities such as super strength, speed, stamina, and a few other abilities. But following his cancer diagnosis, he is recruited to undergo Weapon X testing by Ajax. The stress of the testing and the torture performed on him awakens his healing factor, which prevents Wade from dying and cures his cancer, but not before he is still disfigured from the severity of the testing performed on him by Ajax. Wade still attempts to track down Ajax and Angel Dust, but during one of his missions, Colossus, played by Stefan Kapikik, and Negasonic Teenage Warhead, played by Brianna Hildebrand, both try to stop him. Now, both Colossus and Negasonic Teenage Warhead join the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters based on Cyclops' speech that he gave at the end of X-Men Origins. They come to recruit Deadpool, who Professor X sensed through Cerebro, and wants him to join the X-Men, but Wade refuses. Eventually, Deadpool still fights Ajax, who's played by Ed Screen, and Angel Dust, with help from Colossus and Negasonic Teenage Warhead. Deadpool eventually kills Ajax, and while Deadpool does not agree to join the X-Men, he says he will consider helping them if the right situation presents itself, and he and Vanessa still leave together. Now, side characters from Deadpool, such as Dopender, Weasel, and Blind Owl, all still remain in the project, with Blind Owl being a one-time character, but Dopender and Weasel will be returning in future installments. Lastly, all references to Hugh Jackman's Wolverine and any other Fox X-Men characters have been removed. And the post credit scene is Deadpool breaking the fourth wall to talk about how crazy it is that the person who wrote Black Panther United Forever consistently mispronounced Ororo as many times as he did. So that's Deadpool. Again, I think it is a great film. I really wanted to keep most of the stuff in place. So I'm really glad that Deadpool is a part of our MCU. We will definitely see him in his own projects that will be written by me. But for the time being, I thought it would be easier to just make some continuity changes so we can keep most of the first Deadpool movie the same and have him fit into rebooted MCU. So with that being said... That was the fifth project in Rebooted MCU Phase 5, Deadpool. Now let's talk about the sixth project in Rebooted MCU Phase 5. The sixth project of Rebooted MCU Phase 5 is Moon Knight. The movie opens up in a Jewish synagogue as we see members of the community singing Hava Nagila. We see various people conversing. As the camera pans through the crowd, we slowly arrive at Stephen Grant, played by Oscar Isaac, talking to another member of the synagogue about how he has visited many synagogues before. But Hungary has the most impressive synagogues by far. As the conversation continues, we watch as Steven slowly becomes uncomfortable as he hears a voice in his head. Spectre, you are needed. As the patron asks Steven if he is okay, he laughs awkwardly and says everything is fine. We watch as Steven walks away from the group as the voice gets louder. 
You knew our promise, Mark. Now hurry up before I make you transform. Look, I'm in the middle of something. Can't this wait? I'm sure it's not that dire. You dare talk back to the god of the moon? You are lucky you're a good inventor, boy, or I would have left you and Mark dead. Now, Mark, you better come out, or I will cause a scene at this little gathering of yours. As Stephen begins breathing heavily, he starts walking towards the door as the voice screams, Okay, that's it. Mark, you are coming out. Now. Stephen starts screaming in agony as the patrons of the synagogue turn to look at him as he smiles awkwardly. Uh, sorry, must have been some bad fisherman soup I had last night. I'll be right back in. As we watch Stephen step outside, he begins screaming as bandages begin forming around his body as we see Moon Knight standing outside the synagogue as the voice says, Very good. Welcome back, Mark. Now use the sacred moonstone to fly quickly to Bavaria, Germany. There is a creature of the night lurking. He must be stopped. Yes, I, Moon Knight, the fist of the almighty god of the moon, Khonshu, will do your bidding. We watch as Moon Knight holds a stone and takes off into the night with his cape as the title card appears. As we see Moon Knight flying, Khonshu, voiced by F. Murray Abraham, the man behind the voice earlier, chuckles. You know, Mark, this process should be a whole lot easier, but you and your personas continue to make things difficult. Look, you took us out of our home for years and have made us fight your battles throughout Europe, so you can't blame Steven for wanting a bit of fun once in a while. Besides, he isn't used to all of this stuff yet. Even though I do agree, it does get on my nerves at times. Let's set the record straight, Mark. You forget that it was you wandering into my temple and getting killed by falling debris that caused this to happen. You agreed to work for me as my avatar and protect travelers in the night from the creatures who seek to do them harm, and in return, you receive my awesome powers and a second chance at life. In my calculus, at least, I say that's a fairly square deal that you have repeatedly made more and more difficult. Yeah, the suit, the powers, the second chance, that's great and all, but despite Steven's downfalls, his inventions have been helpful. Remember how useful his crescent darts were in the battle against the Glob when we were in the French Riviera? Or the silver knuckles when we had to fight Gorgola in Turkey? Yes, but would it not have been for your experience as a mercenary, none of those weapons would have meant anything. Regardless, enough with this discussion. Are you ready for this creature we have to face tonight? Do you even need to ask? I'm always ready. What are we looking at? My godly sense of the night alerted me to suspicious activity in Germany. A creature that appears to be powered and has a similar appearance to that of a primate, but appears to be more nimble, quick, almost skilled in how it moves. So this isn't going to be a repeat of the Bigfoot incident, is it? No. Be advised. I've never seen a creature quite like this before. Prepare to hunt. We are almost there. We cut to Bavaria, Germany as we see a creature leaping from rooftop to rooftop as he pants. There has to be something to eat around here. Suddenly, we watch as Moon Knight flies down and kicks the creature across the roof. The creature stands and says, Hey dude, what the heck is your deal? Is this him, Conchu? It is. You know what to do. As Moon Knight approaches the creature, we watch as suddenly the creature disappears as Moon Knight looks around. What the heck? Where did he go? I told you he was powered. No excuses. Stop this creature, Mark, or do I need to bring out the new guy? Absolutely not. I thought we agreed Jake was only for emergency situations. As Moon Knight continues looking around, we watch as a creature teleports back and kicks Moon Knight down. I don't want to hurt you, but if you're going to hurt me, then I'm going to have to do what I must. <laughs> Finally, you're going to let me get my hands dirty. Let's go. We watch as Moon Knight leaps up and begins fighting the creature. Mark's skill and experience as a mercenary is too much for the creature to handle. He falls to the ground, beaten, and as Moon Knight walks up to him and begins to land a finishing blow, we hear Steven scream in Mark's head. Stop! Don't kill him! Please! We watch as the Moon Knight costume slowly disappears as we see Steven reappear as Conchu screams. Mark! I swear! How did the nerd come out? I am so confused right now. Sorry, Conchu. This creature isn't a monster. He talked to us and told us that he didn't want to fight. That's like no other monster I've seen Mark fight in the past. So, creature... Do you have a name? The creature is revealed to be Kurt Wagner, who the local townspeople have nicknamed the Nightcrawler, played by Rami Malek, who is helped up by Steven. He laughs awkwardly. I'm sorry about the other guy. He's a bit rough at times. For the love of Ra. 
Listen, I know a thing or two about weird phenomenon. I mean, one day a golden light came down and turned me into this weird demonic primate-looking creature, but I'm sorry. There are multiple of you? And who are you talking to? Please don't, Stephen. Please don't. Well, technically, as Stephen begins to talk, we watch as suddenly the expression on his face changes. As Mark says, sorry, boss. Stephen, you gotta stop interrupting my work. I know you don't like this stuff, but we made a deal. Good, Mark. Now, finish him off. As Mark prepares to transform into Moon Knight, Conchu shouts for him to stop. Mark, listen to me and listen carefully. Use those bike chains over there to trap this creature. I need you to go to a building three blocks from here and listen in. I'm sensing something. Something that I have a personal interest in. Now move. Mark nods as he prepares to chain Nightcrawler's hands. We cut to Mark sneaking through back alleys as he drags Nightcrawler along as he says, Listen, freak. I know you're probably capable of breaking out of those chains, but if you do, let's just say I have another side of me that's a lot worse than me. Every time he comes out, someone dies. I don't care how far you teleport, but Conchu and this guy will make sure that you're dead. I don't have anywhere to run. Plus, I'm kind of curious to see what this whole thing is all about. This is the building, Mark. Perfect. Thanks, Conchu. What's a Conchu? Shut up and be quiet. We watch as Mark and Nightcrawler duck near an open window as they hear a man inside speaking to a group. As you all know, Harrow has confirmed our worst possible fear. Amit, the all-powerful goddess who seeks to remove all evil from the world before it can be committed, was killed. While we all felt a change in Hero and his powers, he has confirmed this. We hear people inside weep as the man continues. However, fear not, my friends. Hero has located a man, a wonderful man, who happens to be the monarch of Latveria, who is willing to help us out, and even better, for free. Hera will undergo a perilous journey, using this man's new invention called the Time Platform. Hera will travel to ancient Egypt and bring Amit back to the present, where we will once again return to judging the inhabitants of Earth and ridding this planet of all evil! As the group inside cheers, Khonshu yells, Mark, go to the side alley now. I'm going to show myself in my physical form. We watch as Mark moves to a side alley, dragging Nightcrawler with him as suddenly we watch as Conchu appears in a physical form in front of the group. Nightcrawler gasps. What the heck is that? Conchu, the god of the moon. Oh, so that's Conchu. Look, I get it. A scary bird skeleton creature, I understand why you remain hidden. You fool. I don't remain hidden. I see the world through Mark. He's my avatar. And whenever I choose, I can travel from the Duat to Earth. So then, why don't you just stay here? Because then I wouldn't need an avatar, now would I? That's my point. Why do you need an avatar? Because, mortal, most members of the Ennead did not ever connect with humanity the way that the Greek pantheon or the Norse gods from Asgard did. So most of them chose to abandon you and spend the remainder of eternity living in bliss in the Duat. Some of us, however, like me, tend to care about humanity and still care about fulfilling our godly duties, such as protecting people as they travel through the night and in the moonlight. We use avatars to monitor humanity from the Duat. They show us the world, and in exchange, we grant them abilities to fulfill our will. Any more questions, you incessant devilish monster? Are we done arguing, ladies? I mean, Conchu, what's the big deal? Those people in there, they were talking about Amit. She's the goddess of death and execution, my arch nemesis in the Ennead. She felt that we should kill humans who had the potential to cause evil in the world. Well, I felt this would cause mass genocide and leave us with nobody to protect. What does this have to do with anything? She died. She died when the God Butcher attacked the Council of Gods. Many gods who showed up and were in attendance were killed when he attacked the crowd, and she was one of them. So that's why they were talking about going back in time to rescue her. Yes, demon. That is what they were talking about. Worse, the man, the leader of this cult, Arthur Harrow. He's my former avatar, the one who you replaced, Mark. He became the new avatar of Amit, and now he is going back in time to bring her to the present. And you actually think that they can go back in time in order to bring her back. 
That report you watched said that Odinson did it to bring back those wiped out by the purple nut job. I think it's possible, but I need to see this for myself. We need to go to Latveria because if they are attempting to bring her back, we have a major issue. But before we go, dispose of this creature. Wait, why? I thought I established I'm not a monster. Because you annoy me, that's why. We watch as suddenly Steven steps in front of Nightcrawler. Conchu, when you made us your avatar, you agree that we would be doing your bidding to protect people. Kurt here hasn't done anything wrong. In fact, I think he should come with us. He's skilled and has some interesting abilities. And we really don't know what we're in for if we confront Harrow. And if he truly is going back in time to bring back Amit, we're going to need all the help we can get. Conchu groans. You are lucky we are cut for time and didn't raise a completely idiotic point, nerd. We won't need to talk about your constant back talk once this is over. Now, enough chit-chat. Grab the demon, use the moonstone, travel to Latveria, time is of the essence. Steven nods as Nightcrawler whispers, Thank you. We watch as Moon Knight, thanks to Mark once again taking over for Steven, and Nightcrawler use the moonstone to fast travel to Latveria. As the two fly to the location, Nightcrawler clears his throat. So, I don't mean to be rude or anything, but I, I get that Conchu's using you as his avatar. But what's the story behind Mark and Steven? You know, it's not a bad question, because it's something I only learned about once I became Conchu's avatar. I have dissociative identity disorder. I didn't have any idea Steven even existed until Conchu pointed it out to me. And now I'm somewhat able to have control over when me or Steven talk and take control of her body. But it's hard to explain, and I also really don't have all the answers. Don't forget about the new guy, Mark. The new guy? A few months ago, Steven and I both began getting angry with the whole Moon Knight thing. Steven was struggling with the fact that I was a killer, and I was struggling with the fact that I had another side of myself that I couldn't relate with. During a battle with Gargantus, we both had a breakdown. And as a result of the trauma and the anger, a new personality manifested itself. Jake Lockley. He's brutal. He used all of the anger shared between Steven and I and just unleashed it. I told Conchu that he is only allowed to be used in dire circumstances. Even though he is my personal favorite. Never talks back. Always willing to get the job done. Well, hold on. If the Jake personality was created out of some reaction to trauma... Do you think you or Steven also manifested as a result of something that happened in your life? I really don't want to talk about this anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. Shouldn't have pushed. We are about to arrive in Latveria. If those fools who follow Ahmed are correct, the man who invented this time travel device is the monarch of Latveria. So we need to check out the castle where he stays. His castle is apparently called Castle Doom. Moon Knight nods as the group continues to fly towards Latveria. We cut to the outside of Castle Doom as we see Moon Knight and Nightcrawler walking along the castle roof looking for a window to peer inside. As they walk along the roof, Nightcrawler laughs nervously. So, like, there can't really be some guy named Doom that lives in here, right? I mean, not to be cliche or anything, but that is like the clearest indicator ever that this guy is evil. Doesn't really matter. We just need to see if he has some time travel device. And if he does, we need to plan next steps. Hey, look over there. A window. Come on, let's go. The two peer inside Castle Doom into a laboratory. He watches a door opens as we see the monarch of Latveria, Victor Von Doom, played by Killian Murphy, enter the laboratory along with Arthur Harrow, played by Ethan Hawke, who smiles. Your technology and innovation is truly evident by your numerous scientific marvels, Doom. Did you expect anything less from Doom? You should consider yourself lucky that you'll be one of the first to experience my newest creation. My time platform. Now go on, step on that platform over there. I will begin to prepare the device. As Arthur Harrow steps on top of a platform, he watches Doom begins running tests on a computer as Harrow clears his throat. So I have to ask, Doom, why exactly are you letting me test out this device for free? I mean, if this thing is truly as capable as you say it is, then wouldn't people be dying to use this thing from all over the world? People keep questioning Doom, and my answer continues to remain the same. You shouldn't ask why I do what I do. You should just be grateful for the opportunity that Doom has afforded you. You need to travel back to ancient Egypt 
and Doom needs someone to be the first to use his newest piece of technology. Isn't that enough for you? Fair enough. Now last question. I know this is probably silly, but have you considered all of the abstract theories of time travel? Like the whole butterfly effect, or general relativity, the whole one small blade of grass changes everything concept. Doom does not deal with abstract theories created by men with tiny brains. Doom does what Doom wants to do. And what Doom has done is created a machine that will bring you back to 3000 BC like you requested. Now I will bring you back when you are ready. No need to worry. Now let's begin. We watch as Doom types in coordinates as we watch a yellow square appear above Harrow, and as it slowly descends upon him, Harrow disappears. As Doom watches, he laughs. Just as Doom thought. Perfection. As Doom exits the room, Nightcrawler and Moon Knight turn to each other as Conchu says, He did it. He actually did it. We cut to a few seconds later as we see Steven and Nightcrawler standing around as Conchu manifests himself once again in front of the two. He mutters, This is bad. This is very bad. Okay, Conchu, no offense, but I don't get it. If Ahmed has been judging people like this for years, and there have been no mass casualties as a result, what makes you think if Arthur brings her back to the present, this will suddenly change? Because I know what Arthur is like. He's a man set on obtaining power. One of the reasons he decided to step down as my avatar is that I wouldn't let him use my powers whenever he felt like it. Only when I instructed him to. He became frustrated, thought I wasn't doing enough, and decided that he wanted to work for a god that would allow him to assert his will along with theirs whenever he pleased, in order to do what he thought would make the world a better place in his own unique way. Amit was that god, and if she comes back with a man whose will is as powerful as Arthur's, she will become incessant on judging the entire world. And as a result, the world and humanity will cease to exist. Okay, I get your point. But what are we going to do? We can't just travel back in time that easily. And even if we did, we're sort of on a time constraint here. How are we going to make it back in time to stop Arthur before things get bad? I do know one way. An old friend of mine. In the past, I have had some avatars who have allowed creatures to escape from their fist. As a result, I found an individual who has the capabilities of traveling back in time, and I would pay him handsomely to stop these creatures when my avatar failed. Then why didn't we think to use him until just now? He isn't exactly cheap, Stephen, but I think we are fresh out of options. Okay, I hear you. Where do we even find this guy? I mean, what's his name? His name. His name is. We cut to the Cafe Richie in Egypt as we see a man wearing a hoodie sitting at the front of the restaurant looking outside of the window. As a waitress walks up to him, Mr. Nathan, here's your whiskey. As the waitress hands him his drink, he takes a sip and is revealed to be Nathan Summers, played by Joe Manganello. As he places his whiskey glass down, we see Stephen and Nightcrawler, who is being hidden by a trench coat, Standing next to him, Summers chuckles. What are you looking for, pal? I'm trying to enjoy my evening. Are you the one they call Cable? We watch as Summers quickly stands up and grabs Stephen by the collar. The only people who call me by that name either want a beating or they want to hire me. And you don't look like you're capable of either, punk. He's working for Conchu. Please don't hurt him. Summers releases Stephen, reaches into his pocket, and throws cash down on the table and walks outside. We watch the group follow Summers outside. As he sets down a duffel bag and removes his hoodie, it is revealed that his right eye and arm appear to be robotic. Whoa, are you an android or something? That's awesome. First off, heck no, I'm not an android. And second, you wouldn't think this stuff was so awesome if you caught the virus I caught. The techno-organic virus is no joke. Techno-organic virus? Never heard of it before. Yeah, of course not. It doesn't impact humanity for years. I'm from the 39th century. I got the virus when I was a kid from some lunatics when they uncovered the tomb of some ancient mutant whose DNA they attempted to use to cure mutant abilities. Instead, it created the techno-organic virus and impacted me. Wait, you're a mutant? Yep, so is my father and my mother. Although I don't know much about them, and I have no intention to learn either. Okay. 
Sorry for asking, but if you're from the future, then why are you here in 2026? Come on, man. The time period between 2025 and 2030 is one of the best time periods in human history. The new music, the drinks, the sporting events. It's awesome. I'd rather spend my time here than anywhere else. But okay. Enough chit-chat. Conchu knows I charge for my time. Where is he? We watch as Conchu manifests himself and explains the situation to Cable. Cable scoffs. So you're telling me you want me to travel back in time with these two no less in order to stop your former avatar from bringing back a god you hate to prevent global genocide? Sheesh. I must have had more whiskey than I thought. Because this sounds like a total mess. I'm serious, Cable. You know I wouldn't mess around with this. The fate of the world could be at stake. I need you to bring us back to the year 3000 BC. Hold up. 3000 BC? That's what he said. Why is that a problem? First off, I'm almost positive that's the time period where the mutant who caused the techno-organic virus originated in. And second, Conchu. You know how much I'd love to help you out here, pal. But... I'm also a man who loves my money. This is going to cost you big time, and I honestly don't know if you have enough for me. I will have treasure in my temple. I'll allow you to take as much as you want if you help us with this mission. It will be worth billions in the future, so you're walking away from a nearly billion dollar payday if you don't help us out. He watches Cable contemplates the offer before sighing. You know what? What the heck? A billion will do it. But if there's any sight of that ancient mutant, I am getting us out of there before anyone can say anything. Understood? Fine. It's a deal. So, how exactly are we going to travel back in time? The watch's cable pulls out a device and places it on his hand. He says, This is my time travel device. The temporal dial. It was created by a scientist in the future and allows you to travel to points anywhere in the future or in the past. So as long as you guys are within my general radius, we can all travel back to 3000 BC. Wow, that's awesome. So what are we waiting for? Let's go. Oh, Mark, I'd recommend suiting up. We are going to need to be ready to fight as soon as we arrive. As a Moon Knight costume begins forming around Mark, Cable chuckles. You know what, Conchu? I'm going to be charging extra if I have to get my hands dirty fighting anyone. I'm a man of my word. I don't expect any altercations will occur. At least any that Mark won't be able to handle on his own. Cable nods and picks up his duffel bag as he says, Well then, 3000 BC it is. Let's go. As Cable enters some calculations into his temporal dial, Time Travel Yes by the Flaming Lips begins to play as we watch the group begin traveling through time as the screen flashes to white. After a few seconds, we watch as Moon Knight and Nightcrawler look around as Cable claps. Here we are, gentlemen. 3000 BC, Egypt. Hey, Conchu, this look familiar? The air, the scenery, all exactly as I remember it. Okay, great and all, Conchu, but we need to get to Amit as soon as possible. Where would Harrow need to go in order to get Amit? Likely in some mortary temple nearby. Likely the one closest to my temple. It was what made me hate her initially. Give me a minute here. I'm going to ask that person over there about the mutant. Cable, we have no time for this. And besides, they'll have no idea what you're talking about. Let me do this, then we can be on our merry way. We need to take every precaution necessary to make sure we don't encounter this mutant. Fine, but how are you going to communicate with them? Universal Translator. I've picked up a ton of useful tech and weaponry for my time-traveling journeys, and this is by far one of the most useful. We watch as Cable walks away as Moon Knight and Nightcrawler look around ancient Egypt, taking in the scenery. After a few minutes, Cable walks back towards the group. So what exactly did you ask them? I asked them about a powerful creature that was rumored to be present here. They said that they did have a powerful being show up not too long ago, but it was quickly taken care of. Taken care of how? Apparently the pharaoh Rama Tut, or something like that, trapped the creature in some sort of rock formation using some mystical powers he has. He is currently being held in the Temple of Tut. 
A Pharaoh Rama Tut. I don't remember working with any Pharaoh under that name. Now isn't the time to debate this anymore, Conchu. I use the Moonstone to get us to the Mortary Temple. We need to go. Correct. Thank you, Mark. Let's go. We cut inside the Mortary Temple as we see Arthur Harrow standing in front of hieroglyphics of Amit, holding the Book of the Dead. As suddenly, Moon Knight, Nightcrawler, and Cable burst into the temple and shout for Harrow to stop. Harrow turns around and chuckles. Oh, my friends, what are you doing on this sacred ground? We're going to stop you, Harrow. We know what you're trying to do. We can't allow you to bring Amit back to the present. Oh, is that so? And how do you know this for a fact? We watch as Khonshu manifests himself and says, Because I know what you plan to do once you regain Amit's power. Arthur laughs. Oh, how sweet. My former boss coming to visit me. Sorry, though. I'm under new employment now. Hope you understand. This doesn't have to happen, Arthur. We can prevent this now and work together to make our future better. I'm tired of you making these fake promises of action, Khonshu. You're a god, and the most you ever wanted me to do was kill monsters. Your will, it could have been so much greater. Ridding the world of all evil, curing famine, curing instability. But instead, you sit and focus on monsters. Amit wants to prevent evil, so that people can live a life of bliss, not worrying about their lives ending based on some idiot deciding to make a rash decision that hurts themselves and everyone around them. And do you think genocide is the correct answer? Mercy, not genocide. Mercy. I think you and I have a different definition of mercy, pal. And as long as I'm Conchu's avatar, I won't let that happen. How brave. But unfortunately for you, you're too late. Amit, I use the Book of the Dead to request your presence here. Travel from the Duat here to me now. No! Screams Conchu as he watch Moon Knight leap at Arthur, who watches as the Book of the Dead begins to glow. As black smoke begins emitting from the book is suddenly Amit voiced by Saba Murabak, appears inside the temple and hits Moon Knight away. The group stares at Amit, who chuckles. Ah, very good job, Mr. Harrow. I appreciate you performing this ritual and informing me of my unexpected passing in your future. Amit, you know how dangerous it would be to travel back to the present. Oh, well, if it isn't Khonshu, killed any monsters lately? And look... I guess the whole Avatar thing we talked about with the Inni had paid off. And he looks so cute. Bandages like a mummy. Nice touch. He's also capable of bloodshed and destruction. So if you want to see how serious he and I are about preventing you from traveling back to the present, I will be forced to show you. Conchu, Conchu, don't worry. I know you wouldn't let me return without a fight. Sunlui watches Amit's eyes begin to glow red as she says, Inhabitants of this region, this is Amit. I command you to hurry to the Mortary Temple and fight for my freedom. If you want your soul to be judged favorably, you must follow this command. Kanchu turns to Cable and says, Well, I lied about the whole fighting thing. Cable groans, Figures! As we watch him throw down his duffel bag and begin picking out weapons from his bag, he tosses a sword to Nightcrawler. He watches Amit turns to Harrow as she says, I choose Arthur Harrow as my avatar. May he follow my commands as he gains the powers of Amit. We watch as Arthur begins to glow, and as he stops, he shoots an energy blast at the group, knocking them out of the temple. As the group stands up, Nightcrawler looks frantic. Okay, so what exactly is the game plan here? You two. Take care of the civilians, Khonshu will take care of Amit, and I've got Harrow. Do you all understand? Let's do this! Yeah, I guess? Okay then, let's fight! We watch as various battles occur outside of the temple. We see Nightcrawler teleporting around using the sword to defeat the civilians who are brandishing weapons. While Cable uses various weapons from the future, including guns and swords, to defeat the civilians. Moon Knight fights Harrow with Steven cheering for Mark, as we see that both Conchu and Amit have grown to a gigantic size and have begun fighting each other. As the fight goes on, despite the fact that Cable and Nightcrawler are able to subdue the civilians, both Amit and Harrow begin to gain the upper hand against Moon Knight and Conchu. Conchu falls to his knees as he yells out to Moon Knight, Hey Mark, I know you don't like this, but I think we need Jake. No, 
I'm not going to let that happen. As you watch Harrow kick Moon Knight's ribs, he screams, Focus on me, not him. You are trying to prevent me from saving the world. Mark, please listen to Khonshu. We need Jake. We watch as Harrow picks up a sword and prepares to swing at Moon Knight as Mark says, Fine, fine, Jake, please come out. Suddenly, we watch as Moon Knight's uniform begins to grow dark. As Harrow stops to watch, we watch as Jake Lockley stands up and says, Bonsoir. As we see Jake absolutely destroying Harrow, showing no mercy, he begins slicing Harrow with his crescent darts and beating him up with his battle gloves. As within minutes, we watch as Arthur Harrow falls to the ground dead. As Mark regains control of Moon Knight, he turns to Cable and Nightcrawler and says, that's why Jake doesn't come out unless he is absolutely needed. We cut back to Khonshu fighting Amit as Amit yells, No! My Avatar, I need to revive him! We cannot lose this! We've sacrificed too much for him to come back! We watch as Khonshu jabs his head forward using his beak to impale Amit, killing her as he says, Too little, too late. As Khonshu releases his beak, the three cheer as Kanchu shrinks down to normal size and nods at Mark. I really do like Jake. As Mark chuckles awkwardly, Nightcrawler gulps and says, Uh, guys? Nightcrawler points as Amit's lifeless body that has been waving in the wind finally gives way and crashes into the temple adjacent to the mortary. As Mark looks to Cable, he asks, Wait, that temple, it wasn't... Yes, the temple of Ramatut. Where they stored? Yes. Oh my gosh. Watch as the three quickly run inside the wreckage of the pyramid as they see a cracked rock formation and a tall, bluish-looking creature who turns to look at them. Mark gulps. Cable. Is that... Yes, that's the mutant. Exactly how he was described. The creature grunts and begins walking towards the three as Nightcrawler screams, Cable, get us out of here! We watch as Cable quickly rummages to put on the temporal dial as the group starts screaming. Cable quickly activates the device as we quickly watch the three travel through time. As the light flashes, we watch as the three are spit out of the time travel and land onto the ground in present-day Egypt. As the three look around, Mark gulps and points forward as they see the mutant standing in front of them. He was in close enough radius to Cable that allowed him to be dragged back to the present. Cable, send us back, send us back. We have no choice. We can't let this guy stay here. We watch as Cable begins messing with the temporal dial as he stops. Oh no. What? When we exited the time travel, I landed on the device. It's busted. It doesn't work. We're stuck. Mark looks up as we see the mutant's hand begin to glow. Mark turns to Cable and says, You wouldn't happen to know the name of this mutant, would you? Cable gulps and says, His name is... Apocalypse! As the three stare in horror, the camera zooms in on Apocalypse as Apocalypse Please by Muse begins to play as the movie ends. The title card saying Apocalypse Will Return appearing on screen. We have two post credit scenes. In the first post credit scene, we cut inside the X Mansion as we see Professor Charles Xavier, played by Giancarlo Esposito, chatting with Hank McCoy, played by John Boyega, about upgrades that he has made to Cerebro when suddenly Charles winces in pain. Is everything okay, Professor? Yes, just a slight headache is all. All right, Professor, enough chat for the day. You nurse that headache. I'll talk to you later. As Hank exits the room, Charles closes his eyes and sends a telepathic message. Scott, hurry with your mission. I have sensed the presence of a mutant whose abilities are unlike anything I've felt before. The power this mutant possesses, it could be enough to destroy the Earth. Hurry. Now more than ever, the world needs the X-Men. In the second post credit scene, we cut to planet 0259-S, the planet which housed Thanos following the snap. As we see the displaced Super Scrolls who escaped from Scrollos following the events of Secret Invasion have formed a colony on the planet. We see a baby scroll running in a field with his mother as suddenly he stops and points up as we see Norrin Rad, the Silver Surfer, played by Pedro Pascal, who flies down to the planet as the scrolls gather around him. He says, There is no need to fear, my friends. I am Norrin Rad. I am here on behalf of my master, the planet eater who sits on the living tribunal. He has heard legend of your abilities. 
I would like to inquire about a mission he needs your help with. Will you all please come with me? As the scrolls look on, we watch as Silver Surfer smiles. And that is Rebooted MCU Project 5 Deadpool and Project 6 Moon Knight. And yes, Moon Knight probably has the worst ending for the main character in Rebooted MCU. Apocalypse is in the main timeline, and we're going to have to figure out how to stop him. But thankfully, I think there's an elite group of mutants that are hopefully going to step in to save the day. But with that being said, thank you all for checking out the video. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, join the Discord, and follow the Instagram, which can both be found by following the links in the description below. Make sure to check out the Rebooted MCU side projects, and make sure to watch Hercules Prince of Power if you haven't already. The next project of Rebooted MCU will be Black Panther World War, which should be coming out in a few weeks. Again, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time. Take care!